Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Eggleston, and I'm actually a uh, software architect with Arbor Networks. I'd like to start today with a little observation. Um, through 2010, there were over 1,800 emails on the NANOG mailing list having to do with IPv6. Uh, so that's good. IPv6 is big, uh, no pun intended, and <clears throat> there's a lot to talk about. On the other hand, there were about 11 emails dealing with 3G and 4G networks. So I've been thinking about this. Why is that the case? Come up with a couple of theories. One possibility, mobile networks just aren't that important. Second possibility, uh, 3G security and engineering is so good that there's nothing for Neonog to talk, talk about. All the problems have been solved already. Third possibility, the mobile core is someone else's problem. Nanog deals with fixed line networks, uh, and mobile networks no, and mobile operators subscribe to a different group. They're not on Nanog. So as you can probably tell, I'm mostly joking, but I think that there are a few important points here that I'd like to go into a little bit more. So are mobile networks important? Uh, I think there's a couple of different ways to look at this. Um, one, uh, in, in most people's sense, I would say it is obvious mobile networks are getting increasingly important, and especially the data aspect of mobile networking has been rising in importance really quickly over the last few years. Uh, in fact, uh, Arbor's observatory data shows that uh, mobile traffic is actually growing much more quickly than fixed line at this point. And another point I think that's important to make is that even if you don't uh, actually run a mobile network yourself, um, more and more users are interested in attaching to the Internet and connecting to content on the Internet via a mobile device. So if, you, if you're not running a mobile network, uh, chances are users are going to want to connect to your network and your content via a mobile device. So it's worth knowing a little bit about it. Uh, second point is 3G security and engineering already that good. Uh, in a word, word uh, no, and I'll be getting into that a little bit more later. So last point, uh, is this someone else's problem? Well, traditionally in some ways, yes, it was. Uh, it used to be the case that even within one company that had both a mobile and a fixed line network, um, uh, there are two completely separate organizations within the same company. And uh, once the data packets hit the mobile network, basically it was, in effect, you're throwing those packets over the wall and it's someone else's problem at that point. But according to, uh, this is actually data from our um, infrastructure survey, at this point already a third of organizations that have both mobile and fixed have merged those groups together. Convergence is really happening right now. and. Uh, convergence, in a real sense, means the organizations within the network are being merged together. And more to the point, and I think kind of an interesting point, is that uh, fixed-line security groups are seen as having the expertise. So they are being charged now with securing the mobile network. So if you don't care about mobile network networks now, I think that uh, probably pretty soon you will. All right, so I just want to take a step back and go through the agenda for my talk. Right now we're in the middle of motivation. I've got a little bit more to say about that. And I'm going to give a couple of brief examples of the unique challenges uh, with, uh, unique to mobile networks with engineering security. Um, and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for questions. So motivation, why am I up here talking about mobile networks today? Well, uh, Arbor Networks is a security company and uh, when stuff happens, Quite frequently we get called in, and we're frequently called in to help out in mobile networks as well. Um, and uh, over time it's become apparent that really the landscape here is changing really quickly. Um, just in the last few years, uh, the amount of attacks and scrutiny within a mobile network has been growing quickly. Uh, that if you pay attention to the hacker community, the number of the list of exploits is growing really quickly. Um, but it's not clear that the organizations that exist right now in the mobile space are really paying attention to this. Um, so uh, part of my goal for today is to just help kick off the conversation, broach the topic within NANOG itself, and kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, okay. So moving on. Um, 
So NANOG already talks about security and engineering a lot, so why is mobile different? Uh, what are the unique aspects of mobile networks uh, that mean that what we're already talking about isn't quite enough? The first point here, I think, are, is basically these are the, um, I guess you would say the table stakes of mobile networks. These are some of the issues that will always be there. They're slowly improving over time. Uh, spectral efficiency is getting better, especially as handsets get more pow powerful processors and um, are able to do more advanced signal processing. Uh, backhaul is improving. Uh, even now today, mobile networks are moving from TDM and ATM to Metro Ethernet, which helps uh, with the backhaul congestion and that kind of thing. Um, but one of the interesting things about mobile networks, the second point, is that underlying them, there are really a lot of voice-centric assumptions. And from that, you have a lot of machinery to deal with uh, QoS classes and fine-grained billing. Um, and the, the next three points are basically, uh, they flow from the first two. These are some of the results of all that machinery within the network. So uh, it, within a mobile network, you have both a lot of signaling and state. They kind of go hand in hand. Uh, all this signaling is used to uh, track everything the mobile user is doing and enable the billing. And um, then also mobile networks have a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff was built with, based on 1990s assumptions. The protocols are complex and brittle. The protocol stacks haven't been hardened yet. Uh, you've got protocols that, uh, if you look at the specs, it's really pretty amazing actually. You've got TLVs within TLVs within TLVs. And uh, don't get me wrong, some of my favorite protocols use TLVs, but um, it's just really hard with the way the complex and uh, the complexity of all this stuff to get the program and get this stuff right. So the result of that is that there is a lot of places and hackers are just uh, hand over fist coming with exploits and buffer overruns in this area. So just really quickly, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. Just want to spend 10 seconds looking at a, a basic overview of a 3G network. Uh, there's three major blocks, I guess, that you can look at. There's the radio access network. Uh, that includes the cell towers and the, the uh, radio network controllers, and then the backhaul back into the core. And the core is split into two separate components. There's the circuit switch side. Uh, that handles all the voice calls and SMS messaging, MMS, that type of thing. And then they've actually split out the data portion into a separate packet switch domain. Uh, and that's the part of the mobile network that hooks into the internet. All right, moving on into, uh, now I just want to go into a few of the uh, examples of unique engineering challenges within mobile networks. All right, this first slide is uh, basically all about latency. Uh, from a mobile device to a server on the internet, over 80% of the latency is from the mobile network itself. Uh, to me, I, I think that, that is actually just that's pretty stunning, and it gives you an idea of uh, the kinds of challenges we have as far as optimizing application performance within a mobile network. And why is this the case? Why are mobile network, or why do they have such latency? Um, the graphic on the left actually gives one insight into this. Uh, there's a number of devices and between a mobile handset and the internet within the mobile network. And all of these devices have a lot of state and a lot of active processing of packets as they go through them. These aren't routers that are highly optimized for high speed uh, packet switching and forwarding. Uh, every packet has to go all the way up the stack. And in a lot of cases, you have uh, actually, if you look at these, this is kind of a, a, an interesting um, insight in the mobile networking. These device, this is something you don't often see in the internet. Each of these devices has a left and a right hand side to its stacks. And the reason for that is that um, the networks or the, the networking components actually have to translate between two completely separate technologies and protocol stacks as the data trans, translates or moves through the network. So like I was saying, uh, as data travels through the network, it has to go all the way up the protocol stack and often get re-encoded into another networking stack and then sent out the other side. 
this is one of the main reasons that uh, mobile networks have such latency. And really, this is, um, this is something that's being worked on slowly. Uh, LTE and some of the 4G technologies will do a lot. When they talk about flattening the network architecture, they're talking about trying to get rid of this type of situation. Um, but even within LTE, uh, there's still a lot of the, the original voice-centric assumptions. For example, LTE networks actually, the original form of LTE networks uses FD, or frequency division multiplexing for the up and downstream, um, which, is, so basically you have exactly the same channels, channel size, both in the uplink and downlink, which makes sense for a voice call, but doesn't necessarily make that much sense for a data, uh, data transfer. Uh, okay, moving on to the next example. So at the top here, this is actually a, uh, a, ping, a sequence of ICMP pings from my iPhone to a host on the Internet. If you, look at the, uh, if you look at the round trip times, the first packet took over two and a half seconds, or the first round trip time was over two and a half seconds, and after that it gets a little bit better. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, basically, uh, when a phone or when you bring up a data connection, the network goes through a series of states, and it's almost like it's shifting into a high, shifting you through different gears, uh, getting you ready for a data connection. Uh, you usually start out in the idle state, and that's a, that's where my phone was at first, and the network had to shift me into uh, the next state, which is a shared uplink channel called cell FACH. That is generally it's a, a lower bandwidth, higher latency state. And if you use uh, enough, if your data connection is using enough data, then the network may shift you up into a dedicated channel, has uh, lower latency, higher throughput. But if, you, if your data connection slows down too much, if your acts aren't uh, getting re sent back quickly enough, the network may choose to, uh, by, uh, by itself, may choose to shift you back down into a lower, lower bandwidth state. So the interesting thing here is that Actually, all of these uh, parameters are configurable by the network operator. And different networks actually choose different um, parameters for this stuff. And then, of course, different handsets also have different parameters built in. So you can imagine what all this does to TCP trying to optimize its throughput. Uh, you get a lot of um, weird effects and interactions between the network and TCP. All right, this slide just gives an example of some of the, the signaling that goes on within a mobile network. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is actually a decent subset of the signaling that occurs when a uh, phone connects to the network and sets up a data connection. And just to give you an idea of what this does to a mobile network, on the right-hand side, this was uh, with iOS 3, Apple actually introduced a feature called Fast Dormancy that was, it's basically an attempt to preserve battery life that uh, really quickly with a, a short timer after a data connection uh, stops, uh, the phone will switch itself back into the idle mode and tear down the networking connections. So when iOS 3 was rolled out, uh, the extra load from all this signaling just really uh, was ca causing a lot of havoc within mobile networks. And uh, this is, I think, actually an interesting point. If you can imagine if um, it was basically a normal operation or a, a vendor optimization can cause this kind of pro these kind of problems, imagine what a, um, a compromised end host that's intentionally doing this kind of thing can do to the network. So the last of, last of my challenges uh, is, is actually just a, a little bit of interesting data that we've been able to pull from Arbor's Atlas, uh, anonymous statistics. So uh, the point here is really that mobile traffic is actually quite a bit different than, um, than fixed line traffic. It exhibits um, different characteristics. Uh, right now, uh, there's two to three times as much Google, Microsoft, CDN traffic as a percentage on mobile networks as compared with fixed line networks. And I think that this, this generally makes sense uh, if you think about the typical usage patterns of mobile users and what they're doing. Uh, most of the time, if I'm using, my, or using data on my iPhone, I may do a quick search with Google or something like that. So I, I, this pretty much makes sense to me. 
You also see a fraction of the P, uh, P2P traffic on mobile networks as compared with fixed line. And again, I think this makes sense. Um, most people aren't running BitTorrent on their iPhones at this point. Um, and for that matter, most, uh, most mobile networks don't allow mobile-to-mobile uh, -mobile traffic. Now, one of the odd things that we've noticed actually is that there's five times as much Xbox as a percentage on mobile networks as on fixed line. Not really sure what's going on here. Um, probably some things we can look in a little bit more. We have seen some stuff on the, some reports on the internet, some ads for uh, like 3G dongles for your Xbox if you don't have a very good broadband connection. Uh, sort of at this point just more of an oddity than anything else. All right, now I've got just a, uh, want to go over a few of the unique security challenges in the mobile space. Uh, the first, first of all, I want to just look, take a step back and look at this, the state of security within mobile networks. This data is, uh, again, from our infrastructure survey. Um, I think the takeaway points here are, uh, in the words of mobile operators, mobile security is bad. So uh, they even, uh, mobile operators seem to agree that there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of room for improvement. Uh, there's a broad range of attacks against both subscribers and uh, mobile infrastructure. Uh, if you, one of the interesting things is most of the, um, most of the IP level services accor according to the survey are what's under attack. Although my suspicion here is that the reality is that's where the visibility and the tools are. And there's a whole lot of things going on elsewhere within the network, but the, the tools just don't exist. The visibility isn't there to see what's going on. And another point on uh, the state of mobile security, uh, really this has been evolving really quickly in just the last few years. Uh, this graphic at the top is I did a, a quick survey of various hacker conferences and these are the number of reported, uh, sorry, reported mobile exploits in the last four years. So the level of scrutiny within the hacker community is ramping up very quickly. And this is indicative, I think, of just uh, uh, the number of uh, three, actually, three things that are happening really quickly within mobile networks. Um, some of the original uh, assumptions of mobile networks are starting to fall. Uh, that you always used to be able to assume that these were closed networks. There was only a few SS7 interconnects, or they were all trusted SS7 interconnects and GRX peers, and you could trust the handsets to be well behaved. Uh, this really no longer is the case. Uh, you have, there's over 300 peers on the GRX uh, networks or GRX peering points now, and it's really not that hard to get an SS7 interconnect. You can go on the internet and apply for one. And uh, you also, also used to always be able to assume that uh, it was just too expensive to get involved in this stuff. And so by default, there was a bit of, um, a bit of built in security because it was too expensive for hackers to get involved in this stuff. But really quickly, that is changing as well. Uh, providers are handing out femto cells for 100 bucks a pop. And uh, smartphones make a really great attack platform against the network. And then, as I was saying before, the level of scrutiny, just even public scrutiny, is on the rise very quickly. All right, now I just want to go over a few examples of the um, types of attacks we're seeing on the mobile network. Uh, as you can see from all the red arrows, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, I'm only going to hit a few of the highlights. Uh, I just kind of wanted to give it a, a quick overview from this slide, maybe just a reference slide for the future. All right, so. The first example is the uh, types of threats we're seeing on the GI interface. The GI, if you don't know, is the, the interface that connects a mobile network to the internet. Uh, and so I think from that sense, this is probably the area that's most familiar to a lot of the uh, NANOC community. These are a lot of the same kind of attacks you already are seeing. Um, most networks, not all, but a lot of ne uh, mobile networks actually put a firewall between the GI and uh, between themselves on the GI and the internet. Uh, one of the reasons to do this is that uh, unsolicited incoming connections can really kill the battery life, and that's one of the one of the things you want to try to avoid. Uh, so we've been called in actually a few times recently, and one. 
to um, some European providers where their firewalls were just getting slammed with DOS attacks. Uh, and you actually see things coming from both sides, uh, both externally from the Internet and uh, there's some botted hosts. And a lot of it at this point is um, laptops with 3G dongles and that kind of stuff. Um, haven't, but more and more we are starting to see malware and stuff like that on handsets. So I think it's just a matter of time before we start seeing, um, you know, uh, your uh, a lot of the uh, smartphones as parts of botnets. Uh, and actually, in fact, you can already download on a, a version of the low orbit ion cannon for your Android if you're interested in that. Um, so some of the issues with this type of thing is that a DOS attack, not only taking out your firewall, it, it, uh, you start running into, it's, well, the RAN in the spectrum is a limited resource and it's very expensive. So. Imagine what a DOS attack can do to the, the spectrum uh, within a mobile network. Okay, moving on to the next attack. I think uh, this one's kind of interesting just because uh, it's completely unique to a, uh, to a mobile network. And there's a lot of things you can do against the, the RF layer on the, uh, within the network. Uh, in this example, it's basically um, so basically, there, there's a, a random chat, or there's a, a shared channel that a phone uses to attach to the network. And you make a request on this channel, and this is prior to authorization or anything else. So with one compromised uh, handset, you can fill up this channel and basically DOS the, the cell. Uh, no other users will be able to attach to that cell. Well, we've actually seen uh, seen this in the wild. It's kind of interesting that because of the um, these some of these the infrastructure hasn't been hardened, that this thing can uh, travel up the network and take out the radio network controller, which is uh, handling or serving uh, many cell sites, like dozens to a hundred different cell sites. So with one phone, you're able to take out service for up to a thousand or more users. Uh, the, the next unique threat, uh, so as I was saying before, um, mobile providers are starting to hand out these femto cells. And what kind of stuff can you do with a femto cell? Well, I, so let me step back for one second. So a femto cell, uh, you're, you're giving away a piece of infrastructure, basically. And because of that, the specs all say that this needs to be, a femto cell needs to run in a trusted computing platform, it needs to have a secure boot, boot all that type of stuff. And the reason for that is if the femto cell is compromised, you really, you've given away the keys to the network. And there's a whole lot of stuff you can do when you've compromised a piece of infrastructure. Uh, so one of the, the neat things is um, one of the examples from a recent hacker conference, actually, they were able to, uh, a, lot of, a lot of phones have um, unhardened baseband's. And that because of that, they, were, they found some buffer overruns and were able to do remote code execution uh, using like a femto cell and turn on, silently turn on auto answer on phones. So you can imagine with a compromised femto cell and all the people walking by that femto cell, you do some uh, remote code execution, turn on silent auto answer, and then you're able to call that phone and the, the phone silently picks up it while it's in your pocket and you can listen to the conversations going around, on around that person. Might be kind of a fun thing to do uh, on Wall Street or someplace like that. Um, so uh, so one, that's one of the things. You can attack uh, the mobile handsets. Another thing you've got once you've compromised a femto cell is uh, you've got great access to the core of the network. And uh, just to be clear, at this point, despite the specs, all of the Femto cells being given out by North American providers have been hacked. Uh, and the last uh, last example I want to look at just has to do with core signaling. Uh, in particular, this is, has to do with the HLR, which um, the Home Location Register, which is in, in some respects the heart of the mobile network. Uh, it holds all of the subscriber. It's basically a big database. It holds all the subscriber information. Um, and pretty much nothing goes on within the mobile network without first querying the HLR. It has all the authentication keys, uh, subscriber location, uh, everything to do with, a, with uh, subscriber information. Um, 
So, I don't know, we've been actually, we've been calling, uh, there's one provider we were at recently, um, talk about uh, your hardened infrastructure. They're running their HLR on a uh, Windows 2000 box, and it actually had a virus, um, but it was holding up pretty well, so they didn't wanna, they were afraid to actually hook it up to the internet to download updates or anything like that for fear that would actually make things worse. But uh, I think this is just an interesting example of the, the state of the network at this point. Um, and we've also been called in with uh, HLRs just getting slammed with uh, requests or uh, lookups over the SS7 network. And they don't really know what's going on here. They're not sure if it's an attack or just something that's misconfigured. Uh, it's actually, it's pretty hard to tell because the, the infrastructure isn't in place to diagnose and understand what's going on here. Uh, in this particular attack that I've got up on the, or uh, I'm talking about, or I have up on the slide is, um, so people have identified some of the most expensive operations for an HLR, and in this case it's uh, setting up call forwarding. It happens to have to do a, a few database updates and it's not cacheable. You have to go back to the HLR every time you do this. So um, based on standard um, industry benchmarks, uh, if you do up to 500 of these requests per second, so this is a, actually a pretty small bot size, botnet size, uh, you can cut an HLR performance in half. 2,500 and you can completely disable it. And uh, with the, the setup of a mobile network, you're talking about over a million subscribers. Uh, you just basically bring the network to its knees with actually a pretty small bot, botnet size. So, I think there's, and this is actually just, um, HLR is one of the examples. A lot of the mobile infrastructure has these type of issues within it. All right, so to summarize, um, just based on our observations, the, the world is changing really quickly for mobile networks. They used to be able to uh, rely on these assumptions. It was just too hard to get into this space, um, and it's too expensive. Uh, but that is actually really rapidly changing, and uh, we're hoping to try to make sure that there, the community is actually out there look, paying attention to this kind of stuff. It's not clear if there are any mobile operator groups that are doing so today. Um, and at this point, there is really a strong mismatch between, especially with regard to security, between the tools that are out there for mobile networking operators. They're do, really doing the best that they can, uh, but the world is changing quickly and there's a lot to do to keep up. Uh, we're still in the very early days of mobile networking, to be honest. Um, there's a lot that's going to be happening here quickly. It's an interesting place to be in. If you're uh, kind of tired of this traditional fixed line IP networking, mobile is a fun place to get into, involved in. Um, and so for more information, there's some of these, these uh, 3GPP and GSMA are some of the industry groups uh, if you'd like to get involved in discussions, uh, 3GPP has various mailing lists, but they're really mostly focused on the specs. There's not really that much going on there from an operational perspective. Uh, in the same regard, GSMA also has quite some security work that they're doing. A lot of it's focused on encryption, um, but the other disadvantage there is it's really not an open forum at all. Um, <clears throat> participation requires a membership and it's pretty expensive. Uh, the third interesting uh, thing that's going on is the open source community has really started to take up the, take up some work in this area. Uh, in particular, the Osmocom project, you wanna check that out. Um, they're building all the pieces of a mobile network. So if you wanna play with this kind of stuff at home or just set up a lab, this is a, an easy and cheap way to get started. And uh, just because we do have noticed this uh, lack of a good forum for the community, we've actually just recently set up a, a new mailing list, and I've got a link for that down at the bottom. Uh, we've got a few of the European providers already uh, interested in signing up for that and looking for more of the, of the North American providers. Uh, and just anyone who's interested and would uh, like to participate, hopefully this will be basically something that's a little bit that's particularly focused on mobile networks and maybe a, more of a, a smaller, intimate community to begin with until we get the ball rolling anyway. Um, so uh, that's all I've got, and now I'd like to open it up for questions. Do 
Tony Capella. Sorry. Tony Capella, uh, five nines data. Uh, I'm curious about um, control plane, data plane separation in, in this space. Uh, we kind of have it in you know, what we might call the, the fixed networks, but uh, in this one, it seems like you mentioned at least one slide on folks of using uh, access control channels, specifically the unauthentic unauthenticated ones or ones which uh, must, must be open just to function. Mm -hmm. And then you, you detail the ways that things are flowing through even further, which can cause you know, further harm to the mobile operators facilities. But from an end-to-end -end point of view, is there, I mean, presumably you're able to kind of push these things, but do you see much interest from the customers you work with in, in really considering what is control versus what is throughput, rather, uh, what is through traffic or, or data plane traffic, systemically, really? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, with it, with it, within the telecom industry itself and mobile providers, I mean, there is a, a, a big, they always are interested in making sure that the control plane is separated from the, the data plane. I mean, it goes back to the, the Captain Crunch whistle. You know, the, they want to make sure that the users can't abuse the network. But, re but it turns out the way that it has been set up, um, a lot of, um, I guess, yeah, like what I was talking about, a lot of the, the network is set up such that the end host has to do a lot of, or the, the mobile device does a lot of signaling. And then there's also just a lot of signaling within the network itself. And it's not necessarily that you have access to all this stuff um, from the mobile device, but the fact that all that signaling has to take place is just a huge burden on the network. And just doing normal operations, you're not necessarily um, participating in that, but just, for example, like a setting up call forwarding, it's a normal operation, but that um, depends on core pieces of infrastructure and the, the hierarchy isn't there uh, that you would normally see within a, 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 you know, an internet type network. That um, you don't have the, the separation, I guess like, yeah, like you were saying, you don't have the hierarchy, necessary hierarchy that, to protect the infrastructure from these types of attacks. So if someone were to try to draw a parallel or perhaps um, a, a rough recruit analogy, would you almost, could someone argue you know, successfully or correctly that this network is a little too smart for its own good compared to the internet, given that on our internet today, no one talks to my router, right? Maybe if they're doing PIM or something in plain like that, it matters, but it seems like we don't need to have users do more than maybe ARP to figure out how to get to my router and then they're off to the races, right? seems like in the voice world, along the same lines, we, we have to depend on that stuff being baked in. And we can't talk about something that's really end to end. We have to consider the middle pieces as a, as a direct feature that I talk to as a user. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, that's exactly right. I, it, is, it, it goes back to, I mean, when I was in school, you learned about the, the differences between the internet uh, way of thinking and the telecom network way of thinking and as end to end versus uh, intelligence of the network. And really the, the network has been designed such that it, it provides feature or provides services. And because of that, there and there's a lot of heavyweight machinery that's ongoing within the network. Um, and at, as at the point, I mean, I think it, it's this stuff changes really slowly. It, it's not gonna be anything that changes overnight. And so I think in some respects we just have to deal with what's there. Um, but really that there is maybe a, a mental shift that needs to take place. Thank you. My turn. Hi. Hey, Ted Sealy from Sprint. Hi. Slide 14, I think it was, you had some stats on traffic, Google, Limelight, yeah, that one. I'm curious if the Google number, is that an average? And have you done any correlation on the traffic for when new handsets are rolled out and their distribution? Uh, we haven't really dug into this too much yet. Uh, uh, you, but, sh well, you, you should. No, I, yeah, I agree. This is some very interesting stuff going on there. Um, this is actually just, yeah, this is basically, these are from the anonymous stats that we collect, and these are from, from operators so within Atlas, it's all anonymized, but you get to self-identify yourself as a mobile mobile operator. And yeah, I mean, I think that as different, ha that would be a really interesting thing to look at as different handsets come out, the amount of traffic, I mean, Windows 7, or I'm sorry, Mobile Phone 7 comes out, how much how much does Microsoft traffic go up, et cetera. That would be interesting things to look at. Thank you. Slide. 
So, um, sort of study, have you considered the, right now a lot of uh, mobile providers are doing the 3G offload? How does that change the landscape of overall security perspective? And also, what are the most popular app apps for the you know the data part of the enabled by the by the higher bandwidth 3G 4G network? Uh, I mean, I guess I, I don't really know if I can say on what are the most popular apps. I, I do know that there is, just within the industry, there is a, a trend. People are talking about a lot of ways to try to improve um, 3G performance. Uh, moving on, uh, you know, moving on to WiMAX or LTE networks is one way to help improve the, the latency. But the other idea is, like you were saying, there's a 3G offload where you kind of, you shunt the, shunt the data traffic before it even gets to the mobile core. It's, it's kind of a, a funny uh, phenomenon, actually. It's kind of like you've, you're just throwing up your hands and saying, you know, uh, we're not going to be able to fix this, so let's just drive around the problem. Um, but it, yeah, that is uh, one of the things that I hear people talking about quite a bit. Thank you.